Nice. Maybe for some of you, it's that beach getaway with the little cabana and the all-you-can-eat buffet. Okay. Maybe for some of you, it's that time with family. Maybe for those friends that you just love to hang out with. Maybe for you, paradise is not having to go to work tomorrow, but still having the money to pay for your bills that will come on Tuesday. <laughs> Maybe that is paradise. What is your picture of paradise? If we were honest with one another this morning, we could actually see that you and I spend a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of money in the pursuit of a little taste of paradise here on this earth. For example, my wife and I and our two kids went on a um, cruise last April. And don't even ask me what island we went to. I don't remember and I don't care. It was an island, there was a beach, and there was water. Normally, all things I hate. Um, but my wife loves. So I kind of submitted to that and we went on this vacation. And I got to say, I experienced a little bit of paradise. We found this private island with this private beach. I got to swim with stingrays. And the all-you-can-eat buffet was literally around the corner from where we had put our towels. It was perfect. The water was warm, and it never got deeper than this, and I hate the water. So I felt safe <laughs> and secure. It was paradise. But in order for my family to experience those few days of paradise, I had to work like a dog for a year and a half, squirreling away every little bit of money I could save. There was no Christmas presents that year. That was the present. There were no birthday presents that year. That was the present. There were no anniversary presents that year. That was the present. I had to kind of cut back on the caramel macchiato at Starbucks because that was six bucks that I could put into the all-you-can-eat buffet. We had to do work to experience this little bit of paradise. You and I work really hard to experience paradise. Our definition of paradise and this morning, I want to look at the words of Jesus and the words of the Apostle Paul to see what they have to say about paradise. We're in week two of a series called Words from the Cross, and this series is leading us to Easter Sunday, which is coming in just a couple of weeks. And we are looking at the words of Jesus from the cross while he is hanging there, while he is dying for our sins, he speaks some very powerful words and we need to look at those words and then you and I need to ask ourselves the hard question of how do the words of Jesus on the cross reflect how we are living our lives? If you're here today and you would call yourself a follower of Jesus, you and I need to look at the words of Jesus and ask ourselves, how do the words of Jesus from the cross reflect how you and I live our lives. Today we're going to start in a passage from Luke chapter 23, and this is my ultimate favorite story in the Bible. Now, if you've been coming for a while, you hear me say that almost every Sunday. <laughs> okay, I get it. I admit it. So, but this one truly is my favorite story in the entire Bible. So when you come next week, well, I'm not preaching next week. When you come in two weeks, and you go, and I say, this is my favorite passage from the Bible, you are allowed to say, liar! <laughs> because you affirmed what your real favorite story is. This is my ultimate, ultimate, ultimate favorite story in this entire book. That's what we're going to look at today. Because I believe in this story that we see, we see the heart of God. All throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, he was declaring that the kingdom of God had come, that the kingdom of heaven is near. He was doing healings, he was doing miracles, but the message of his preaching was to point people to paradise. And then Jesus is condemned to death, he's beaten, he's flogged, he's whipped, he is literally bleeding to death while he is carrying his cross to the place of his crucifixion. He's being mocked and ridiculed by the crowds around him. 
He's nailed to the cross. He's hanging there dying. And then look at the words of Jesus, starting in Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 38. It says, there was written a notice above him which read, this is, king of, this is the king of the Jews. When the Romans crucified him, they listed his crime above him. And it didn't say he was accused of being the king of the Jews. This is the king of the Jews. Crucified. This is the king. Then beside Jesus were two criminals who were also being crucified. And it continues in verse 39. It says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Why don't you save yourself? And us too. <laughs> while insulting the king. Could you save me while you're at it? <laughs> okay, hurling insults. But the other criminal rebuked him. He said, don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. There is such an incredible beauty and richness in this short little story, just a few sentences. But I firmly believe we can see the heart of God, his love, his mercy, and his compassion right here. We see this criminal who is hanging on a cross, this criminal who the text doesn't tell, tell what he did. We don't know what his crime was, but he does. He knows exactly what he did. And he is, un, he is facing the death penalty for what he has done. And he's hanging there on a Roman cross, dying, going, I deserve this. My crime deserves this death penalty. We don't know if he murdered people. We have no clue what he did. But this criminal, this man knows he is getting exactly what he deserves. And in that moment of recognition of his crime, he turns to Jesus, someone that he recognizes as not deserving what he's getting. That Jesus is completely innocent of the crimes against him. And his crime was saying he was God. You don't get put on a Roman cross for saying, love your neighbor. You don't get put on a cross for putting on a cardigan and sweaters and saying, be nice to people. You get put on a Roman cross by Jews when you say you're God. That's his crime. And this criminal says he's not guilty of any crime. <laughs> he is the king. And this criminal looks to him and says, Remember me. Jesus, will you remember me? When you come into your glory, Jesus, will you remember me? I'm a criminal. I'm a sinner. I'm an evil doer. I deserve this death. I am bad to my core. But Jesus, will you remember me? <laughs> And Jesus' response is not, ha, got ya, suffer, suck it up and die, you sinner. That's not how he responds. Jesus turns to this evildoer. Jesus turns to this man who's committed crimes that deserve death. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, paradise is more than just heaven. The word here that Jesus uses, paradise, is pointing the criminal back to the Garden of Eden. I think sometimes in our spiritual Christian culture that we live in today, we think that when we die, we're going to be angels uh, wearing diapers and little wings, playing a harp, shooting arrows at each other, singing kumbaya. <laughs> 
Okay, but scripture actually points to the fact that there is a resurrection coming. That you and I will have a resurrected body that we, there, where there will be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more illness, no more suffering. On a new earth, we will be restored to paradise. Ever since Adam and Eve were in that paradise and they sinned against God because they wanted to be like God, when they gave in to the temptations of Satan and did what God forbade them to do, God started a mission in the world. From that moment, God started working throughout human history to bring humanity back to paradise. And that mission hasn't stopped. <laughs> it still continues to this very day. God is still on mission to bring people to paradise. And he's chosen to do that through you. Whoa, that's a little too much responsibility. Thank you, no thanks. <laughs> but this is what I want us to look at today. I want us to see how the words of Jesus today you, can be, you, are with, you will be with me in paradise. Reflect how you and I live our lives as people on mission to see people come to paradise. I want us to look at a text that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church that shows us this mission that we are on, that shows us how these words of Jesus still play out and how you and I live our lives. If you have a Bible, you can open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is the text we're going to look at. I'm going to start in verse 19. If you have the church app, you can follow along that way as well, or the Bible app as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 19. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth about this mission that we are called on to point people to paradise. This is what the Apostle wrote. He says, Though I am free and I belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. The church that Paul was writing to um, was going through a lot of problems. <laughs> I know it's hard to imagine the church having problems, <laughs> okay? But since day one, the church has had lots of problems. And maybe you're here today and you're new to church and you're not too sure about this church thing because churches have problems. Uh, it's not new. We've been dealing with problems for 2,000 years and uh, hopefully we're trusting God more and more in those problems. <laughs> but this is what Paul is talking about. He's talking to this church that's dealing with lots of problems. And one of the problems that they're dealing with is who is the church for? Who is the church for? Who should be coming to this thing called the church? There was a group of people who were firmly believing that the church is for church people. You better be good. You better be holy. You better be righteous. You better not have any junk going on in your life. Get your act together. And once you clean up your act, then you could be a part of our church. That was one group of people. There was another group of people who were saying, you know what, doesn't matter how we live. We can do whatever we want. 
We can sleep around, we can drink, we can party, we can live any way we want because Jesus loves me and he forgives me. So here you got this clash of people in the same church going, we only want the holy rollers and another people going, doesn't matter what we do. Jesus loves us. Can you see the problem? <laughs> Can you see the tensions that that would create? Can you see the infighting that that would cause? And Paul writes this letter to this church going through this struggle to remind people what the church's mission is all about. Why did God even create a church? And what does God want to do through the church? And Paul starts this section off talking about being free. That I'm free. Right? Paul is talking about that we are free from the power of sin and death because of our faith in Jesus. Paul is saying that we are free from the slavery to religious laws in order to try to please God. Paul is saying that we are free from the wrath of God because God has to punish sin in his holiness. He just has to do it. He can't ignore it. But we're free from that wrath because Jesus paid for it. Paul's words here in this text reminds us of the words of Jesus where Jesus said, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Right? But even in his freedom, Paul chooses slavery. Now that might seem like a weird concept for us because we get what slavery is all about and we don't like the idea of slavery. Slavery is bad. But Paul chooses slavery. Why? So that he can win as many people to the gospel. So that he can point more and more and more people to paradise. But Paul is not saying, um, to the thief, I became a thief. Paul is not saying, to the adulterer, I became an adulterer. Like he's saying he's still under the, 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 the fruit of the spirits you know, that, that's working in his life. He's still under the commands of Christ to kind of follow Jesus, let the Holy Spirit work in his life to let it transform him to become more like Christ. But Paul, what he's saying in this text is that Paul is bending over backwards. He is bending over backwards to make sure that he is sensitive to the non-Christian society around him so that he doesn't hinder people from coming to Jesus. To the Jew, I became like a Jew. To the Greek, I became like a, the Greek. To the weak, I became like the weak. Because Paul doesn't want to hinder people from coming to Jesus. Because it's about paradise. <laughs> Ultimately, the mission of Jesus was to point people to paradise. The mission of the church is to point people to paradise. The big idea today that I want us to look at this text a little bit more is this. Our lives are meant to win people to Jesus. If you want to know what your purpose in life is, if you are a follower of Jesus, your entire purpose in life is to be used by God for his glory to win people to Jesus. About four years ago, I, I was invited to a leadership event here in the city of Ottawa and a bunch of pastors and, and, and ministry leaders all got together with this grand vision uh, of putting on this marriage retreat. And they wanted to kind of fly in kind of these world-renowned experts, these world-renowned authors, and put on this big, huge conference in order to make Christian marriages better. Now, I think that's a great idea. I'm a big believer in making Christian marriages better and healthier and more vibrant. Big believer in all that stuff. But I went to this meeting and something wasn't sitting right. And I'm the type of guy, maybe you haven't figured this out yet, but when something's not sitting right, I have to kind of say it. I don't know if it's just the ADHD in me, I just kind of blah, and then have to deal with the blah after it's come out, okay? But I'm in this meeting, and they're all excited, and it's going to cost like, you know, X number of tens of thousands of dollars to bring these people in. We're going to put on this conference. We want 10,000 Christians to come to this. It's going to be huge. It's going to be amazing. And then I said, what's the point? 
well, we need to have Christian marriages stronger. I was like, so what? And one's looking at me like, what do you mean, so what? It's like, well, we need to have Christian marriages stronger. I'm like, but why? If you look at eternity, eternity is a big, long line. Our marriages are a blip in eternity. And Jesus actually talks to the religious people of his day and says in, in eternity, there's no marriage. So we're going to put on this big, huge thing to strengthen marriage. No, don't get me wrong. I believe in strong marriages. <laughs> but what's the point? And then someone kind of much smarter than me got up and started talking about how, you know, the marriage is an earthly representation of the church's relationship with Christ. And so we need to be all theologian-like and be, you know, when our marriages represent this, it's a representation on the earth of the relationship between God and the church. And then I went, okay, again, so what? <laughs> What's the point? I didn't get invited back to the other meeting uh, that happened after that. Uh, and I was okay with that. And then I actually had some, and, and I said, look, the reason I will get behind this conference, because I want Christians to have a strong marriage so that non-Christians will notice the difference in their marriage. I want you to have a strong marriage as a Christian couple, not just so you can reap the benefit of it, because in an eternity, who cares? But so that your non-Christian family members can see the difference that Jesus makes in your life. The blessing that you are receiving from following Jesus should be a blessing to other people. That is the purpose. So I'll get behind that. And then one of the other leaders came up to me and he said, you know, Pastor Kevin, um, I really don't think you should be a pastor. <laughs> I'm like, what? Why not? He said, I think you should um, go work for an organization like the Billy Graham Evangelistic of of Association because you care so much about people who don't know Jesus. And that's when I just went nuts. I just lost it. I said, if pastors don't care about people who don't know Jesus, why would we ever expect churches to care? If pastors don't care about people who are far from God, why would you care? We'll just huddle. We'll do our Bible studies. We'll do our conferences. We'll do our stuff. And we'll sing our songs. And then we'll die. <laughs> And we'll go to paradise, and the people we love will go to hell. We should care immensely about lost people, because that is the purpose for why you were saved. So you could be used by God to point people to Jesus. Our lives are meant for so much more than the little pursuit of paradise that we're running after like rats. We work so hard to get a little bit of paradise, but God wants to do so much more in our lives as we reach people for Jesus. So let's look closely at this text from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want each and every one of us to be able to answer today three questions. I have asked myself these three questions a lot this week as I've been prepping for this. So I want you to look at your life how do the words of Jesus from the cross impact how you are living your life as a follower of him to be used by God to win people to Jesus? The first question is this. I encourage you, write these questions down. Talk about them in your life group during the week. If you are not in a life group, we need to get you into one because that's how we care for one another in this church. Email me. We will get you into a group. Okay? But question number one is, what are you a slave to? What are you a slave to? None of us like to think of ourselves as slaves. I don't. But if I'm really honest, when I think back of when I was working really, 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 really hard to be able to go on that cruise with my family, I was a slave to the cruise line. I had to do every single thing possible to make sure that I could afford this because I didn't want to be the guy to go to my wife to say, oh, baby, we didn't save enough money. We can't go. That ain't happening, <laughs> okay? She would have not been happy with me because that was to celebrate her 40th birthday. We set everything up around this. So I'm like counting my pennies. I'm going, do I go to Starbucks today or do I make church coffee? <sighs> I'll have church coffee, <laughs> okay? Our coffee's awesome. Yeah. Hopefully you have some at the cafe afterwards. <laughs> but it's not a caramel macchiato, okay, for 650, <laughs> okay? 
But we can so easily become slaves to pursue the little things of heaven that we are, of paradise that we're fighting so hard to get. And Paul says, I've chosen to make myself a slave to lost people. I've chosen this, that I will be a slave for them. I will work for their blessing. I will serve them so that they will come to know Jesus. And they too will hear the words of Jesus that today you'll be with me in paradise. Sometimes I think we as the church, we think of reaching people who don't know Jesus as a checklist. We think of it as a burden. We think of it as a problem because I don't really want to deal with all of their problems. And I get it. I, I'm the first to admit it. I'm the first that would love to have a break from people's problems. <laughs> okay, because I deal with people's problems every single day. And as a pastor, you might find this hard to believe because you listen to me preach every Sunday. I'm actually an introvert. <laughs> I'm an extroverted introvert. I know, you're looking at me. No, you're not. <laughs> like you're bouncing all over the place. You're an extrovert. No, you're tiring. You wear me out. I need a break from you, okay? I need to go hide in my little geek basement cave and be by myself. Oh, so nice. And that's how I get recharged. And then I can walk with you and then I can journey with you and all those things. So I've actually made decisions in my life where I'm gonna join stuff intentionally to run away from people's problems. Because I just want to go play. I just want to go hang out with my geeky friends. I want to do geeky things around the city. I just want to play. Can I just not deal with anyone's problems for a day, God? And God goes, <laughs> and he sends you to these little organizations, these hobbies, these groups that you go to that you're a part of, and he brings you the person who's going through the divorce. He brings you the person who just had the miscarriage. He brings you the person who just found out their kids are, suffer are addicted to drugs and alcohol. And God says, be a slave to those people. <laughs> love them the way I love them. Reach them the way I want to reach them. Right? Who are we, what are we a slave to? Because all of us can choose our master. <laughs> and we need to choose our master very carefully, according to what Paul teaches here. Paul teaches the church that he has chosen to make himself a slave to people who need God. Second question that we have to ask ourselves is, what have you become to all people? What have you become to all people? This is a great question for all of us to ask. When non-Christians look at you, are they drawn to Jesus? Or are they repelled from Jesus? And that's a hard question. And I'll admit it. And I asked that question of myself um, because I am a Baptist preacher. And when I get invited to parties and people say, oh, Kevin, what do you do for a living? And I say, I'm a Baptist preacher. <laughs> the reputation of Baptist preacher has gone before me. <laughs> and that conversation is going to go one or two ways. It is either going to become so hyper-spiritual that I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Or it's going to be so uncomfortable that they don't want to talk to me. <laughs> because of my reputation as a Baptist preacher has gone before me. What have I become to all people? Are we drawing people to Jesus? Or are we actually the stumbling block for people coming to Jesus? I think sometimes we as Christians, and I'm a big believer in protecting the rights of those who can't protect their own rights. I am a big believer in fighting for the least of these. I am a big believer in defending Christian morals and Christian values in our culture today. I am a huge believer in all of these things. But I think we've done it wrong. And don't ask me how to do it right. I haven't figured it out yet, but I think we did it wrong. When we're telling people what we hate, when we're protesting, when we're angry and when we're fighting, are we actually attracting people to the good news of Jesus or have we become the stumbling block that prevents people to come to Jesus? I think sadly, sometimes a lot, we're the stumbling block. So what have we become to all people? And the final question we all need to ask ourselves is, how hard are you running the race? 
How hard are you running the race? Paul finishes this, sec this section of scripture uh, basically talking like um, comparing the church to a professional athlete. And if a professional athlete wants to win the gold medal, a professional athlete will make sacrifices, will train, will stop going and getting the caramel macchiato because supposedly there's a lot of fat and sugar in those things, okay? They will train hard. They will do the work. They will strive for the gold medal. And Paul is saying, that's our call as the church. How hard are we running? We had a leadership breakfast. There was a couple of leaders yesterday. And one of the things that came up is sometimes we fight so hard to keep everybody comfortable. We just want the church to be comfortable. If it could just be comfortable, then more people will come and the numbers will grow, and they'll put more money in the basket. It's just comfortable. But nowhere in the Bible does it say our faith in Jesus is comfortable. It says, run, train, work at it. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds like work. <laughs> Thankfully, it's the Holy Spirit who works in us and through us to accomplish these things, but there's a training that goes on. We have to ask ourselves, how hard are we even trying? Like when we go to life groups, when we go to Bible studies, when we go to conferences, when we go to worship concerts, when we go to church, why? Why do we do all these things? Is it just so that we can be blessed? Or is it so that we can grow in our faith to be a blessing to other people? So that we could look people in the eye and say, there is a way to return to paradise. And I'd love to tell you about that and they'd actually want to listen to us. I think sometimes we as Christians, we think we're off duty. It's like, oh, I'm a Christian on Sunday. I'm a Christian in my life group on Wednesday night. And then I can just be off duty for the rest of the week. And Paul says, no, run the race. Run the race. Run, the ra run like you're trying to win it. <laughs> because there's a prize at the end. And the prize isn't for you. <laughs> and so that person that you love will be with you in paradise. It's a great prize. It's worth giving our lives to.